and goal would have waited a long time for this. Hello everyone, you're very welcome to the Irish Examiner Gaelic Football Show in association with Renault. My name is Paul Rouse and I'm down in the Galway football heartland of Toome in the run-up to the 2022 All-Ireland Football Final. This is a, a football town, it's a town of the Toome Stars, of the Toome Stadium of St. Charlotte's and previously Toome CBS. It's a town of Ja Fallon, of the terrible twins Sean Purcell and Frank Stockwell. And of course, it's the town of the Saw Doctors. And for this very special edition of the podcast, I'm delighted to be joined by Leo Morn of the Saw Doctors. Thanks a million for, for, for letting me, well, let me into your home, I suppose, Leo, is the first thing. Well, I'm delighted to be here having the chat. It's, uh, it's uh, one of my favourite subject matters, so this is easy. You love football? Yeah, yeah, I do. Growing up in Toome, we were never bored. We had great fun and we had loads of sports, but... Football was always the primary one. And we grew up in a town where Sean Purcell and Frank Stockwell walked around the streets. Sean Purcell actually delivered the Irish press to the house every morning before he did this, went to teaching. And then as you got older, you'd... Was he the news agents? He, he had. His mother had a news agent up the street here. Uh, it was called the Connacht Tribune Shop. And yeah, he was the delivery boy for the, for the newspaper. Like, this is in my, in my uh, childhood... And uh, he had been, obviously, a big football star at that stage, but he was just like somebody we all knew. He was like a neighbour, and he loved going to the races, and my father was a bookie, so they were friends. And just the fact that you had somebody, or people like himself and Frank, walking around the town of such stature, it made football greatness seem very normal. And we were very lucky as kids. They were really good uh, talent, they were really good talented young lads in uh, in Chum when I was growing up. Um, in 1974, Chum won the Connacht Community Games under 13s and went to the final, lost the final in Butlins against Dublin. Now I was younger than that, and I wouldn't have been on the team anyway. But there was a great blast of talent at that time as well, and just football and enjoying it and having some success were kind of the norm, really. As as I was growing up. I came down here um, earlier and I just walked the town, walked down Bishop Street and looking at mm. shops and, and went over to the stadium and just wandering around. It's a, it's such a football town. Like I noticed from, say, the opticians down the road, there's a picture of the Hogan Cup winning team from 47 mm. hanging hanging in the doorways. And, and if you look at it, Toom Stars have the record number of Galway Senior Football Championships. Jarlets have the record number of Hogan Cups or All-Ireland College Championships and so on, so on. And, and of course, Toome Stadium hosted so many kind of football finals and big matches of all of all descriptions. So the whole atmosphere of the town is, is it's a football town. Yeah, and football has got brought great joy and fun to Toome. And Toome people love to see a crowd come into town. They love the fact that there's visitors and they're to be there to be entertained and they're to have crack and particularly when the Mayo crowd come to Chum. There's there's huge connections between Chum and Mayo because of all the boarding schools and the ecclesiastical connections. The, um, the there are Mayo people with real Chum connections, went loads of them went to school here and, and have businesses here and got married here. So there's always been great crack and rivalry, but but connections and fun as well. So that rivalry. So I, I I know Galway people, who there is there are no circumstances in which they would shout for Mayo, and they actually ended up shouting for for Dublin in the four or five in a row matches, those, those series of matches for against Mayo. But there seems, it seems to me there's a little bit of a bitterness in that kind of a stream. But there, then there's other people who would end up shouting for Mayo. Where do you stand in that? And where I, do you stand in I that? I think there's supporters like that in, in every group of supporters. Yes. There's always the fanatical ones and the really partisan ones. And then there's the ones that think, definitely, you know, it'd be nice to see the neighbours doing well. I was always a Mayo supporter. I went up to the 96 final when they drew the match. And I thought the draw was even worse. It was like a funeral. It was worse than a loss or something. It was, it was a terrible result. But um, 
Uh, we, we've always loved Mayo and we've always gone on well with them. I went up to the Derry semi-final in 98 and I had been living in Clonborough and I knew a few young lads from Clonborough at the time. And we were standing on the platform waiting for the train to come home and I heard one of the lads from Clonborough saying, and of course they'd be very borderline with Mayo. Yeah, yeah. One of them said to the other, he said, Jesus, at least you're as good as me all now. <laughs> <laughs> and that was like, you know, that was a real satisfaction for him because the, the, the rivalry and the neighbourliness of it. And c- can I ask you about your family? Your, so this connection is not just a town connection. It's not just that it was in the atmosphere. But your father was hugely involved in, in the GA in Tum. He, he, he seems to, he was a Galway footballer. He won... For people who don't who don't know this, he was a Galway footballer. He was he won a county championship with the Tomb Stars. He was a referee and refereed a county final while still being a player. Twenty four years of age, refereed a county final. I'll tell you how I know this. Um, I I was talking to John Tobin, the great Galway coach, and and John very kindly through Jim Carney. Jim Carney, as you're aware, is writing a history of tune football in the 50s and 60s and he has a section written on your father in it and he very kindly gave me that section uh before coming down here it's 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 beautiful but it's also amazing the stuff that that he did so this referee the connor or re- referee the galway county final at 24 was chairman of the galway county board county football board at 28 and still a player during these years and that seems to me to be to, to talk about an extraordinary love of football in the family. Oh, yeah. He, um, he loved it. He refereed a, a junior All-Ireland final, actually. And he played in an All-Ireland minor semi-final against Cavan. And he's, he always said there was a man called Harry Butcher. He said, Harry Butcher bet us on his own. And Cavan went on to win that final. And... Yeah, he loved football and obviously he went into the administration of it afterwards and he, he gave us a great love of football. He was always on the stadium committee over here, so we were always welcome as all the local kids were to be going over there. In the early 70s, we had the Galway teams competing in the All-Ireland Finals. They'd be training over here. We'd be over being the ball boys and the ball girls. So we were all very well connected like that. But yeah, my dad kind of... Uh, he never spoke much about it. He, he used to talk about the minor semi-final, all right. I'd say he'd like to have won that one. But uh, other than that, he, uh, he it, it's from the articles I read now that I'd find out more about it than I did from himself. Yeah, he didn't He didn't talk about that. He was no. a, he was a, kind of an extraordinary man, though, wasn't he? In terms, like a uh, local, he was a bookie, but yeah. an auctioneer and had a farm. He seemed to have, <laughs> and I, I, I found this newspaper article from the 70s, um, shortly after the ban, was removed and it was a, a fundraising match down here between the Galway footballers of the early 70s and a soccer team which had Johnny Giles, Eamon Dunphy on it. And they played a half Gaelic and a half soccer across a fundraiser for the hospital, I think. For the yeah, for the Chum Stadium gym. Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay, so, yeah, and, and oh, not Chum Stadium, Chum CBS, sorry. Go yeah, on. and and he he was chosen to referee it, he was asked back to referee it. So yeah. it was obviously he was a kind of a a notable figure around yeah. around the town. Well, there was a huge connection there, you see, with the soccer players of Paddy Mulligan. Paddy of Mulligan, is, is, his mother is from Chum, and his co- first cousin, Terps, was in the Saw Doctors for years. So Paddy loves Galway football, so it would have been his organising ability that would have got the, the other soccer players to Chum Stadium that time. And he then, he then brought you from the very beginning across the road, we should say that, the house that you were brought up in, the house you live in now, where we are recording, is it's a Shawnee O'Shea free kick from <laughs> from from the stadium. Yeah, you can see it out the window there if the trees hadn't got all their leaves on them at this stage of the year. Yeah, and, and so it's just it was a like I said, a second home to us being over in the stadium. We could go over to the stadium anytime we want and have a kick around into the goals. What a pl- privilege! Like you know, it was magical, and it wasn't something you ever got. You took for granted or got used to. It was just something that was available, but brilliant at the same time. And and because of that, that love of football, love of Galway football, love of the area, and you played yourself. I did. I was. Uh, I played. I was useless, you know. But I. I wasn't. I. I just wasn't good enough. I, I have a county minor medal. We won the county minor medal in nineteen uh, county minor championship in nineteen eighty two, and I was kind of like first sub. 
But it was a good job, I'd say, that I wasn't brought on because I'd say none of us would have medals if they were depending on me. <laughs> That's not what I've been told. That's not what I've been told. <laughs> it's very modest. But no, but, I'd say it's fairly true. But those lads who who you so so the golden years of Chung football were the fifties hmm. into the early sixties when Stockwell and Purcell were were they were they were like they were you know the most famous footballers in the country really in the in the mid fifties and arguably uh, amongst the best as the terrible twins and their presence in the town and what they did for the town like seven championships in a row and a couple either side of it as well and then another team came through. And it's their presence in the town. And you have a brilliant line in one of the songs about seeing them walk in the town and seeing that they had football in their feet. Yeah, I think Even, that's the Park Stevens line. Is it a Park Stevens line? Yeah, he, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But the, yeah, I suppose that's the thing. You imagine them dancing around the place. I think the, the beautiful thing about when people talk about them, it's not so much that they won so much, but they gave people so much pleasure and they seem to have played the game with imagination and... A different level of of beauty or something that that people loved watching them playing, like, and I think that's important as well. Not just the yeah fact that they won things, and and the team, their sons, then would have come through and played for tune, and they'd be your more or less your vintage. Yeah, they? So, absolutely. Yeah. So Francis Stockwell, for example, and 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 John and John, John Purcell. Yeah. So they'd be your they'd be your group. Yeah, a little bit older than me, and they won a couple of county championships themselves in the eighties. What was that like? Oh, that was amazing. Uh, but they were the era that I'm talking about went to Butlins back in 74. There was this pocket of talent at that time as well. And uh, they came to fruition then in, in the in the 80s. And it, it, it wasn't a surprise because they'd won all the way up. They'd won it under 13 and minor and under 21. So when they, when they managed it at senior level, it wasn't a really a, a surprise. Like. And is football still as important in tune now mm-hmm. As when when you were oh. when, when when you were when you were a child, you want to come up to Chum Stars on a Tuesday evening. Like there's hundreds of kids up there kicking ball. It's fantastic, more than ever. And of course the girls, the whole, there was no girls playing in our time, and now it's like fifty fifty, and it's just um, it's a hugely successful and fun thing to do for people, and it, it's huge at the moment among the, among the kids. Yeah. And, and it might, might be even bigger now than ever. Yeah, in terms of participation, yeah. and yet there's a struggle. I know Jeff mm-hmm. Allen is involved in the club, does huge work mm-hmm. with the club, and is probably the last really celebrated footballer that came out of Tum. And is 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 there a sense of expectation that a championship can be won again, or is it back to the idea of of the that fun that idea of 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 enjoying the football? Well. They've been competing very well in in recent years, and they were fairly close in a couple a couple of times. And uh, they brought Curriff into a replay in one final. And with the numbers coming up now uh, underage, you'd imagine that it it can't get anything but better in in the near future, you know, or the n- middle distance future anyway. As 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 it runs, as it runs through, and in all of this time. You were a Bob and you, you, you went to All Ireland finals in the yeah, 70s. Yeah, I was awful young. It was the time you go over the turnstile and sit in your father's knee. Like, I was at the one in 1971. I was very, very young. We got the train from Chum. Uh, off, awfully won it, obviously. It was an amazing thing for a child to go up and see your heroes losing because, you know, all the heroes you had ever seen before on television or whatever, they always ended up victorious. Mm. And then. Same thing again, 1973, up against Cork, and Jimmy Barry Murphy had his magic day. And then in 74, up against the new dubs. And so Galway lost three finals, 71, 73, 74. And so you, were at, you were at all? I was at them all, yeah. And obviously very disappointing, but it was a great lesson in life as well. And at the time, you could say Galway were like the, the Mayo of the time. They had three final losses in a very quick succession. And then came back again... And had another final loss in, yeah. in in eighty three to Dublin. Yeah, another tight one. And you're beginning to think at that stage, this is this is this is a lot of a lot of loss. Yeah, and the sixties, the three in a row was beginning to fade into the distance further and further. Yeah, and the memory of that, it kind of me- memories and the legacy of success can be a burden. Yeah. To and so there's the burden of history, the burden of failure, 
or, or close failure. And you, you, you talked, you wrote a brilliant piece 20 years ago. I found it in the papers where you talked about how these men were your heroes and how they were fantastic footballers, but they feel, seem doomed just to come slightly short. Yeah, like I think as somebody like Tommy Joe Gilmore was a colossus of a player, fantastic footballer and a fantastic man. And he was just so unlucky amongst other great players on the team. But but if you if I was to single out one, he was just a, a magical character and he was great every day. And he was just unlucky that he didn't get the ultimate prize. But that's what happens. I don't think he'll have... I don't think it has changed his life for the worst. But 1998, Galway, I won't say came out of nowhere because there had been underage teams that were tipping along. And they didn't, But 1998, you, the success in 1998, what, what was the meaning of that success for, for you on a personal level? Well, it was... The, I'd been... Like, like we've said, I'd been at the 71, the 73, the 74. Seeing the 83, I was in America in 83. But... um. You, you were so used to the disappointment that the that, but the success wiped it all away. It was so worthwhile, and I always think you know counties that win it seldom. It means so much more to them. There's 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 great satisfaction and a certain amount of joy for counties that win it on a fairly regular basis, but there's ecstasy when a county wins it for the first time in so long. It's just a magical, magical thing. It's a great way of of getting people's spirits up to a level that they can't get at normally. I want to talk about the music of those years. We are going to talk a little bit about the Saw Doctor songs, and I think you're going to play a tune for us later on. But though you 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 released a kind of a side project with Park Stevens, also like brilliant songwriter from from this area, and you released that those kind of ninety eight and two thousand and one. There was a kind of a there was yeah. the bits and pieces of songs that came out of those period. It, it actually straddled the era between the tape and the CD. Did it really? Yeah, Did the ninety eight really? was on tape and the two thousand one was on CD. Released as the folk footballers. Yes, and the songs in that they're 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 about the love of football, love of football, and I I saw a reference to it. Tommy Conlon wrote a lovely piece in mm. the. In the Sunday Independent, um, it was it was two decades ago now about it and about it's how how it was basically a homage to, to what he called the beautiful game. <clears throat> and that, why did you release that? Why did you release that album? Well, when Galway got into the final that time after winning the semi final against Derry, there was going to be three weeks or there was more than there is now anyway. And I said to Boric, "Do you think might we do a song for the team for the final?" And Porrick said, no. He said, we'll do an album. <laughs> <laughs> and we did. Now, we were kind of cheating a bit because Porrick had a few football songs already written and recorded. So we kind of just had to top them up, really. We had, we had more than half the album. Our Porrick had more than half of it done. So we wrote a few other ones. And we managed to get 10 songs together for the tape for 98. And then we expanded it a bit then for 2000. The first fifteen, yeah, and and how was it received? We gave a copy of the tape after the All Ireland to the each member of the Galway panel, and they were looking at us like we had two heads. They, I think the connection between music and football was kind of um, it, it didn't make. I suppose they were so taken up with the football side of things. They mightn't have seen why how it could be connected to music. And maybe musical people mightn't see how you could have 15 songs about football. I'll tell you a funny thing. We had the tape on sale at a gig in England. And it was the folk footballers, 10 songs about Gaelic on, on the on the bottom of the tape. And I heard a woman saying to her husband at the... At the so she said, oh. no, the print was small. I wouldn't buy 10 songs about garlic. <laughs> 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 but uh, it, it made sense to us because Porrick always loved football. Porrick, uh, Porrick's father was on the on the team that won in, it was the 25. And um, uh, Staff Stevens, he was a famous uh, Corofin football personality. So Porrick had as much football in his family, uh, if not more, than was in my family. He's, 
His brother Sean won an under twenty one with Galway uh, back in the early seventies. So they were they were always connected. Parik played a bit of football himself, and it was just very natural for us to want to rise about the crack of it all. And you went into the stadium. You went into the dressing room in in <laughs> in Tum Stadium to record the great Connacht final song. Yeah. We did. Sure. We went up for the bit of reverb, a bit of yeah, yeah, and the feet, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and 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 that that idea of of football. So John Tobin, he paid John Tobin for those people who don't know him was a very fine footballer, brilliant coach, tremendous GA man, and a huge Tomb Stars uh, lifelong contribution to to this place. And he spoke about how in Football is a huge part of life in Toom. But he also talked to, and he talked about how proud people were of to grow up in the place of the terrible twins and Ja Fallon and, and prevalent the show bands were here. And this connection between football and music that you kind of brought together in this. And he said like there was a huge pride in that in town. It's all generates it all generates a bit of fun, doesn't it? A bit of football success and a bit of music. To me, it's an obvious combination. And when the two of them work together, all the better. And it, like the Tomb Stars, I was saying at the moment, you go up and there's loads of kids, and more than ever, it's the same with the music. There's loads of kids playing great music all the time. It's fantastic. So that's going to continue, and that's a. That's very important, and it's a great satisfaction that it will. And in '98, you played at the homecoming. You, you played at the dinner afterwards, and you played the night before in College Green. <laughs> yeah, nearly on the squad at that, that, that. The Burlington was mad. We were in the Burlington afterwards, and. A band had been hired to play at the function, a local Dublin kind of a wedding band. So they were all saying to us, well, you go up and do a couple of songs or whatever. And somebody went up to the band and asked them, could we go up and do a few songs? And they said, no way. They said, that will cause chaos. There'll be people up on the stage and whatever, and it'll be too dangerous. So somebody, Pierce, Pierce Doherty was our bass player. He went up and he said, look, we'll get you a deposit. So if there's any damage, <laughs> you can keep the money. <laughs> So he, he got together a few hundred quid, I don't know what it was, and he said, we put it at the side of the stage, and then they announced us. And we said, no, there'll be nobody up on the stage. So we went up on the stage, half the team was on the, the stage. stage Richie. <laughs> Stamping around on things, but nothing got broken anyway. And of course, it was chaos. Like It was beautiful chaos, because it was unprecedented. None of us had ever seen this. It was completely new to us all. And it was the West's Awake as well, though, yeah, wasn't it? It, yeah. was, it was the idea of... Sam coming back across the Shannon. Yeah, and it was such a long time. And and the other aspect of it, I think, which is massive, and it's massive in your music, is the connection with people overseas. And I I know that you had a couple of UCD students, for example, uh, Derek Savage and John Dibley and a couple of others over in London. Yes. Which he, in a gig afterwards... There was a wonderful Galway supporter, Dipna Burke from Dunmore. She was God rest her. And she she did everything for the supporters club. And we had a gig on the twelfth of October in the Albert Hall. Completely coincidentally, it was our most ambitious gig ever in London. And it looked like we were going to get away with it. It was it sold out. And we said, Wouldn't it be brilliant if we could have the cup over in London? 
for uh, the fortnight after the final, more or less, isn't it? The final, yeah. So um, we asked Dimpna, and Dimpna said, you know, the cup was trying to go everywhere. She said, but I'll do my best. So Dimpna managed to get the cup. And I always remember she was, I didn't see this now, but she had the cup on her lap, getting on the taxi in, going in the motorway into London. And there was probably Irish lads in a truck, you know, a building truck. And they were going, that's a somewhere. <laughs> 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 So we had that and we had John O'Mahony over and we had Damien Mitchell and Kevin Fallon and Derek Savage and Don, John Divley over for the night and we produced the cup. Now obviously it would mean something to a lot of people at the Scottish Fist gig but in other Not words, to everyone. Not to everyone. But they got the excitement of it. You know when the cup was brought out and they knew we were excited. It was a magical moment. And lads were kicking, there were footballs on the stage yes, and yeah. and John Dibley launched the ball into the Royal Box. If, uh, well, yeah, he did. Royalty probably were not present. I don't, I don't think they had. They used their season tickets. That did, yeah. <laughs> but that idea of, of that bit of madness yeah. at a Saw Doctors concert and, and for anyone from Galway to see Sam on stage in those circumstances, it must have brought a certain bedlam to... Yeah, I think it would have been magical for Galway people. But also, I think the excitement was there anyway for... The fact that it was just so, such an amazing coincidence. We were so lucky, like, and the Dimpner managed to do the, do the uh, honors and get the cup across. And you know, you know now when, when you hear say the N17 played after, it was an amazing thing actually after the Galway Armagh quarter final, which was such an incredible occasion and ending in the penalties. And there was absolute Armagh people were really. They were really devastated after their loss. I'm one of very proud of their team, but devastated in their loss. And then Galway Crowder celebrating and delirious. And N17 came on the Tannoy system in in, in Park. And Galway people were, everyone was singing along. But I looked around me where I was sitting and there was a few Armagh people singing too. <laughs> well, hopefully the song goes across the borders. That's That's what you'd hope for. It, it catches me by surprise every time. I, I'd be thinking about the match and digesting what happened, and then the song comes on, and I go, oh, I forgot about that bit. <laughs> it's a great buzz when you hear a crowd singing like that. God, it's magical. Communal singing is, is, is something that brings people to a level that they can't normally get to. And it ties with the football, though, isn't it? Mm. The identification and, and um, Brian Sheen, who does this podcast, with us ordinarily the former Kerry mm. footballers, great footballer, he, he was saying that he he uh, he knew we were coming down to, to have a chat and he was saying that his great wish is that he doesn't get to hear N seventeen <laughs> for <laughs> more or less for the rest of July. Um he wouldn't mind to hear it in August now. <laughs> yeah, August is fine, I think, but but uh but not at that point. And then and but you've also written the Mayo song, really. Yeah, well that's that was just pure luck. We went out to a festival in Clare Island back in 1990. Never been out there before. The Maumeen Cajun Band were playing out there. And we all went out. And it was a magical night. We went on all night. And we were coming in the following day in the boat. Beautiful Sunday. The be most beautiful day of the year. The sea was flat calm. Two bay. And we were looking up at Crow Patrick. And the, the hills were... Red and green, as you know, the heather and the grass, and we were saying that's that's obviously where they got the jerseys from. So we started making up this poem, and Jerry Mulholland was there with us. He's known as Jerry Al Majar now. He's actually Alan Mulholland's uncle, and he contributed a good few lines to the poem we made up, and we had it written on an envelope or the back of a cigarette box or something. And Davy took it and he put a tune to it, and just happened like that it happened very naturally and for years it, it kind of sat underneath the radar and then it kind of bubbled up into people's consciousness of, about being a song for the Mayo team and it kind of is now <laughs> yeah it's taken it's 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 taken off yeah and um, and that that sense of belonging is I was trying to think about this I know you went to you went to Galway and to college in Galway and you did sociology there mm. and your Michael D lectured you. He's a brilliant lecturer, a brilliant teacher and yeah. just an interesting, interesting man. But did 
that idea of a small town, did you take any of that back from sociology and think about what it was like to be in a small town or about football in a small town? Did you think anything around that? I'm sure I did. I don't know if I was able to see it um, objectively, though. I think it was probably subjective to me to see football in a small town and see how how important it is and how much fun people can have from it and the potential just to to bring people to somewhere, like I said earlier, that, that they can't get their normal life. And, and in the band, though, not everyone's a GA fan. No, I'm not a football at all. fan. No. And isn't it interesting in a in a town that people think like I always think everyone thinks everyone's in Kilkenny. In Kilkenny's interesting. I don't know a lot yeah. of people in Kilkenny. They 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 just don't care. And in fact they react against it. Is there a reaction <clears> against that football thing in 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 Tum as well, among certain things? I don't know if there's a reaction against it, but there's plenty of other things going on. It's a very strong soccer scene. I played a, I played more soccer actually when I was young. Did you really? Then I played football, yeah. And um there was a great basketball scene here in Tume as well at the time with great connections with Ballina. Uh Lee McHale was the best basketballer in the country uh, at the time. Possibly the best basketballer that Ireland has produced still. And there was all kinds of other sports going on. You have athletics and gymnastics. And so football isn't the be all and end all for everyone. Of course it isn't. But it, you know, it's probably the highest profile, obviously. Would you trade any of your musical success to have played for Galway. I probably would have one time, but when you think about it, musicians are luckier than footballers because I'm 57 now and I can still do what I was doing when I was 23. And in actual fact, I'm probably a bit better at it than I was at the time. But it's hard on athletes and footballers because they can't do that. So I think in the long run, I would have loved to have had some sport and success, but... In the long run, you're better off to have something that you can keep doing for longer, which is which is what we're at, and we're lucky with that. And you're there's something there's an incredible kind of parallel going on here in a in the sense that the saw doctors are back gigging this summer in the just as Galway return to an All Ireland final. It's lovely to get associated with positive things. I think that's great. And and the fact that people would associate us with the with the football success. I mean it's pure coincidence, but it's great. <laughs> and I'm going to I'm gonna ask you if you'd play if you would you play the maroon and white first? I will, of course. As a as a way to finish up. Yeah, this is one of uh, this is one myself and Parik put together for the folk footballers album at the time and it uh, kind of works. I dreamt I'd wear the jersey All Ireland final day I'd stand out there in Crow Park With a mighty part to play We'd run out of the tunnel To a great big Galway roar We'd have our picture taken And head down to the goal Line up with the captain and march behind the band. And when they play the anthem, we'd face the flag above the stand. Cause me heart is in maroon and white, I'll stick with what I know. Maroon and white forever, no matter where I go. When the ball comes towards me, I turn and head for goal, and I stick it in the corner like a bullet, hard and low. And I dreamt I'd hold the medal so precious in my hand, with the people all around me and the ghosts up in the stand. Then on Monday evening, we'd bring the cup back home. The bonfires would be blazing all along the road. Cause me heart is in maroon and white, I'll stick with what I know. Maroon and white forever, 
and hailstones, rain or snow. Yes, maroon and white forever, that's what I always say. The maroon and white of Galway, forever and a day. The maroon and white of Galway, forever and a day. That was absolutely, absolutely wonderful. Um, and I can't think of a better way to finish. I can't think of a better way to tie together the meaning of football and to this town and to the county and I suppose what, what the match means next weekend. And um, we can only hope for, I think, for a fantastic match. That's it. And let's see what happens then. Absolutely. When it all ends. Thank you. A pleasure. Thank you for having me on. Woo! <laughs> Thank you to Larry Ryan for running this podcast, to Rap Rocker. Jack Neville, to Tony Lean for making it happen, to everyone examine our support. Thanks to Renault for their support. Um, Bainish Arnashkalua.